All right, everyone. I just want to thank you for listening. A um, couple of housekeeping items. Uh, there's going to be a survey uh, that gets sent to anyone who uh, listens. Uh, the uh, people would really appreciate uh, MedShape. Uh, really appreciate it if you could uh, fill that survey out. Uh, we're also going to do the questions at the end. Um, on the uh, probably right side of your screen, there's a questions tab for the GoToWebinar meeting. Um, if you could enter your questions there, I'll get to all of those at the end. Um, I'm Jason Barito. I'm an assistant professor of orthopedics at Emory University, and I'll be talking about the uh, MedShape DynaNail tonight. Um, let's see if I can get this rolling. So uh, disclosures for me can be found at the AOS website. I am a consultant for the company. Um, some background on me, I'm an upstate New Yorker. I did med school in Syracuse residency at Brown. Uh, you can see me here in my residency uh, on a lot of snow, which I think will be relevant to my next slide. Um, but overall, uh, I did my fellowship in Dallas and practiced in Emory for three years. I try to start with a joke, a couple things I've learned in my training, uh, what the difference between Texas and not Texas is. If anyone is practicing in Texas or knows, uh, they'll appreciate this slide. And again, uh, if you've ever lived in the South and have seen a snowflake, uh, you've seen this reaction as well. But seriously, uh, the objective of tonight's talk, uh, we're going to talk about tibio talo calcaneal fusion. Uh, I'm going to review some good points. Uh, we'll talk about some significant weaknesses I think that uh, can occur. Where are the areas for improvement? Uh, I think intramedullary devices are an important tool. Um, and I'm going to review some unique features of the Dyna nail and the evolution of intramedullary nails, and some of the unique differences that the Dyna nail provides. We'll do some case examples talk about some clinical research related to the DynaNail, uh, and then have a little discussion at the end. So what is a TTT fusion? We all know this. If you're listening to this talk, uh, you're an advanced foot and ankle specialist, likely you're a resident out there. Uh, but it's an anatomic fusion of the tibia, talus, and calcaneus. Uh, frequently thought of as a salvage procedure. However, uh, I really think of it as a reconstructive procedure, and I try to teach that to my residents. I think there's been some good literature lately that patients can have some pretty good outcomes from some pretty bad pathology. Uh, it is an option of last resort, though. You know, frequently we're trying to save the ankle joint with ankle replacements. Um, and often a discussion we're having with patients is whether to have a TTT fusion or an amputation um, for these really complex problems. But when do you need a TTT fusion? One of the big problems that I think we see TTT fusion are for Taylor avascular necrosis, uh, Charcot arthropathy, uh, failed total ankle replacement, or those patients who have unbelievably severe deformity, uh, the severe uh, stage four um, posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. Um, is uh, another common area. But what do we know about Taylor AVN and the current uh, treatment procedures? This is a nice systemic review by Chris Gross. Um, they looked at 19 different studies, um, and six of those studies looked at arthrodesis procedures after AVN, not just TTT fusion, but even just looking at other types of arthrodesis procedures. They had high complication rates, significant amount of delayed or non unions. If we look at Charcot arthropathy, this is a nice study uh, by Steve Weinfield and his group. They looked at 27 patients with Charcot, 16 were treated with a nail. 11 were treated with a ring external fixator. Two years of follow-up, they were able to save the limb in 15 of 16 uh, of their IM nail patients in 10 11, but both groups had similar non-union rates, uh, and it's about 40% if you do a total 17 of the 27 patients. Um, so that's really a high non-union rate in this group, and uh, I certainly think there's room for improvement. Total ankle replacements, I think, going to be a big uh, area where TTC fusions are going to uh, come down the line. Uh, there's significant bone loss when they fail. If you look at Steve Haddad's article, uh, which I uh, show you here, uh, he did a nice systemic review looking at uh, uh, failed total, looking at total ankle replacement ankle fusions. One of the things he showed is that many as 20% of patients have poor outcomes, uh, and those patients often re, you know, need another surgery or revision, uh, but down the line are often uh, leading to a TTC. And this often requires bulk allograft, which we know from other work has a high risk of non-union failure. Um, and if anyone's had this walk into their office, which I had recently, uh, this is a, you know, a failed total ankle replacement uh, that you can't revise. Uh, these need a TTC, uh, and the incidence of this is only going to increase. And so having uh, a number of treatment options, uh, um, especially through these hard, complex ones, um, is going to be important. Um, but what are the clinical outcomes of TTC? This is a systemic review uh, by Dane uh, Wolkich. Uh, he pulled all the studies on TTC fusions, and if you look uh, down here, Excuse me. If you look at the bottom of the screen here. You know, approximately 80, 86 uh, percent had a union rate. I think this is radiographic union. Uh, it's not by CAT scan, um, and it's probably lower than that in these more complex cases where I think the dynamo is really helpful. Um, but we know TTC can uh, do good things. Uh, it's a study out of Dallas and uh, Jim Brodsky's group. 
uh, who uh, uh, was my mentor and who trained me. And they really showed some interesting stuff. Uh, uh, TDC fusion can really help patients. You can uh, increase cadence, walking speed, but you got to get them to heal. Slight decrease in sagittal plane motion, but uh, not a complete loss. Um, but I think thinking of TTCs uh, or hind foot fusions as a uh, reconstructive procedure is poor. But they're not without problem. You know, I think non-unions is the biggest thing. One of the interesting things that we're doing here at Emory, uh, you can see on the pictures to the right, is we're trying to develop an animal model uh, because we think this environment is unique. We think there's an understanding of bone healing at the arthrodesis site is different than long bone fractures in some ways. Uh, we think the fusion mass may be different. Uh, it's, it can't tell us surfaces as opposed to uh, cortical surfaces. Uh, we really aren't sure if it's intramembranous or anchondral. Um, and is the ankle or foot itself different? Uh, is there left soft tissue? Uh, and again, often bulk allograft is, allograft is needed. Uh, which can be challenging. But there are non-unions in the literature for sure. Um, if you look at Mark Meyerson's study, uh, which is the study here to the left, uh, they had about 50% of patients who required bulk allograft uh, have a non-union, uh, and 20% of his patients went on to a below knee amputation, which is really high. Uh, and then uh, the work out of uh, Craig Burlett and his group, uh, you know, they showed that uh, only about half their patients fused, and again, uh, 15-ish, 16% of patients are going on to an amputation with these large defects. Um, and I think this is one of the areas where a uh, dining nail can be really helpful. But there are other things that have been tried. Uh, this is a study uh, from the guys at Utah. They looked at the blade plate. Uh, and they really showed that blade plates had higher non-union rates than other fixation options. Um, but there's one article I think I want to discuss because I think this is really important uh, in this recent article, and it doesn't really have anything to do with uh, TTC fusions, but it overall thinking about healing around the ankle uh, foot. Now, this is the augment article or the uh, recombinant human derived platelet derived growth factor. Now, they look at autograft and PDGF, but the, the real important point is if you look at autograft healing by CT for these joints that probably have a higher union rate than uh, tibio talo calcaneal fusion. There's only really 65% of patients at six months have a healing. So I think there's an opportunity um, to improve our healing rates, uh, to improve our outcomes for patients. Um, and I, I think TTCs are likely to have an even higher non-union rate uh, than what's been shown. So when we think about TTC fusions, people talk about using screws, talk about plates and screws. We talked about blade plates. I think frames are a really good option, but they have their own associated problems, pin tract infections, issues with patient compliance. Uh, I, I personally try to use intramedullary rods whenever I can. Um, and then you have to talk about your approach. Uh, some people like the anterior and combined lateral approach. Some people like a transfibular all lateral approach. Uh, and often people are looking at a posterior approach. There's a good article by the guys out of Duke talking about a fibular splitting approach. Um, and I often even try to get the back of the posterior uh, tibia to fuse to the calcaneus um, instead of using bulk allograft sometimes and go posterior. And we'll talk more about that later in the talk. But if you look at the TTC techniques, people are constantly trying to uh, find ways to improve it. Uh, this is an interesting article of the Junior Foot and Ankle Surgery. They're talking about combining uh, internal and external fixation on the same group of patients. Uh, they put an X-fix on top of their TTC. Uh, I think that's an interesting thought, um, but I think some of the gains that they're making uh, may be demonstrated by the things that make the dyna nail you need. So when thinking about intramedullary rods and hind foot nails, um, eventually, Originally, it was screws and plate constructs. Uh, people used external fixators, which I think are great. Uh, then people started thinking about intramedullary nails without compression, you know, static intramedullary nails. They then added an external compression element, an external and internal compression element. Uh, and then I think the last evolution is what the uh, Dyna nail provides, which is continuous compression. So just looking at it a different way, first generation nails have static locking mechanism on each side. Uh, second, second generation nails allow for the compression through the compression rod slot, um, allow fixation in the talus. Uh, third generation have an internal compressive element. Um, but then, um, you know, thinking about the fourth generation, uh, which is continuous compression with the Dyna nail. When you look at just the outcomes of these types of nails, uh, there's a good study by uh, uh, Philbin and his group. Uh, they looked at 198 patients uh, in his series. Uh, over eight years. Um, they had two nails with an internal compression mechanism and three without. Uh, the non-compressive nails did much worse, you know, 40 to 45 percent non-union rate of both the subtalar and tibiotalar joints. Um, but they, the compression nails uh, didn't do it, uh, they did a little better, but not tremendous amount better, uh, still around 20 percent non-union rate for both of those joints. So I still, again, there's opportunities for improvement uh, of healing. 
So if you look at the uh, IM nail versus a frame, uh, it's you know you got to understand uh, what the problem may be with some of these nails. Uh, if we uh, look at a, this study by uh, Yakikaki, which looks at uh, compression forces, when you take the uh, away uh, resorption uh, at the bone surfaces, which I think definitely is happening, and I've seen that in some of my patients um, who haven't had a Dyna nail, that as the resorption occurs, you lose your compression across that joint, uh, and that may lead to loss of healing. Uh, and as you can see, an X-fix uh, prevents that. And if you look at the X-fix, you, you really got to get out to almost 20 millimeters of reabsorption. Uh, before the significant amount of compression is lost. Um, but is there a way to get these gains that the X-Fix provides without all the associated issues of an external fixator? Uh, and I think the thought is, is that the Dyna nail can provide some of that. Uh, thinking about the Dyna nail, uh, it's really uh, providing the bending and torsional rigidity of an internal uh, IM nail with the axial compression and stability of a multiplane external fixator. Uh, and it's accomplished this way uh, through the night nail compressive element uh, that's within the center of the nail. Uh, this is just an example of the Dyna nail. You see the dynamization slot um, in the top. It has a titanium outer nail body. Uh, there's headed cortical screws approximately. Uh, it does have a headless uh, uh, posterior to anterior screw uh, as well as a um, lateral to medial screw uh, uh, to go into the talus um, distally uh, and with the night nail element in the center. Um, so again, looking at the compressive element, uh, the uh, a nitinol compressive element. We all are aware of what nitinol is. Uh, probably uh, used it in nitinol type staples. Uh, it's, a, it, it's always trying to get back to its original uh, position. Uh, the internal nitinol element is stretched uh, and then fixed distally, or fixed proximally by two, uh, two screws in the calcaneus, excuse me, uh, and then uh, either one or two screws proximally. Uh, the sliding element pulls everything together uh, to give, provide continuous compression across both your tibial tailor uh, and your subtalar joint. Um, and so you can see immediately uh, after the surgery is over, uh, there is uh, a space uh, for the screw to slide, uh, and that screw is sliding based on how much the, the element is compressing. Uh, the total amount of that space is about six millimeters. Uh, as you can see, as the patient heals, that uh, continues to compress uh, over time. Uh, and there's also a, a dynamic screw uh, uh, space proximally, which allows continuous compression after the nitinol element has fully compressed. Uh, although um, I've only seen that start to occur in uh, very few of my patients. Uh, I think the six millimeters is probably adequate for most patients that I've taken care of. Um, and what does this sustained compression uh, provide? Uh, you know, with the Dyna nail, there's up to six millimeters of post-operative compression during bone absorption or settling. Uh, and this provides uh, uh, similar to external frames uh, because it uh, can store some of the energy. Uh, you can see here the compressive force of the Dyna nail uh, over the six millimeters of compression, you know, outwards of, you know, four and a half to five millimeters, you're still getting, um, you know, around 400 newtons of compression. Where the other nails at about one millimeter, they're down to zero. Uh, this is much similar to a external fixation device. Uh, but it's also a load sharing element. Um, and I think this is one of the interesting things about the Dyna nail. It's super elastic properties allow it to transfer load and immediate dynamization afterwards which allows the load to be feel, felt across the bone. Uh, and it doesn't stress shield like other nails, um, which is demonstrated by these graphs here, um, which I think is an interesting point because bone needs stress to, uh, to heal. Uh, and I sometimes worry that we're too stiff um, uh, and we're not uh, uh, sharing the load um, with some of these patients. Um, so what is the data on the Dyna nail? I, I can tell you about my personal series. Uh, I've done over 20 of these in my practice at Emory. Uh, we've actually got a uh, abstract at this year's AOFAS, uh, looking at uh, the first eight that I did. Uh, I only use them for my really high-risk patients, uh, patients who have a previous non-union, uh, patients who are diabetics, who have Charcot, uh, AVN, uh, and we were able to look at the ones that I have a minimum of one-year follow-up on. Uh, we looked at their pain and their activity level afterwards. Uh, we measured the amount of compression uh, at two weeks, six weeks, and 12 weeks. Uh, we tried to identify if they had radiographic union uh, on two views. Uh, we did a blinded analysis of our radiographs uh, uh, by a board-certified orthopedic surgeon and one orthopedic resident. Uh, we were able to show that 8 out of 8 of these patients had radiographic healing at 6 months. Um, 8 out of 8 of the patients were full weight-bearing. Uh, as any uh, uh, one who knows it as TTC, is frequently there's wound healing issues, and we had one patient we had to take to the operating room for an IND. Thankfully, we didn't have to take out their hardware. Uh, they went on to heal without a problem. Uh, but significant improvement in their visual analog pain scale and 
uh, most of the patients were really pleased. Um, and so we're presenting this this, uh, this summer. Uh, but if you look at our measurements of their compression, which I think is really interesting, uh, at two weeks, uh, they average a mean compression of about 2.9 millimeters. Uh, at six weeks, uh, again, you know, it continues to increase up to 3.8 millimeters. Uh, and at 12 weeks, the mean average compression was 4.4 millimeters. And this is similar to work uh, uh, that the guys up at Duke, uh, I know Sam Adams really well, Lee, uh, they wrote a nice paper looking at um, the diamond nail. Uh, they looked at 15 patients with a, you know, roughly a six-month follow-up. Uh, their average compression was 5.58 millimeters at their last uh, uh, follow-up, uh, and they had really good healing results. Uh, and I think this is a really good paper uh, looking at nine now. Um, but I, I think the most important thing is probably want to see are, you know, how do we use the nail? What are some case examples? So we're going to go through some case examples now. Uh, we're going to look at um, some patients with infected RIFs, fusions, et cetera. Uh, some of these patients are poorly controlled diabetics. Uh, one guy has a uh, significant Charcot of his ankle. Uh, we'll look at a failed total ankle and the use of bone uh, bulk allograft here. Uh, if you look at case number one, uh, this is a really nice guy. Uh, he's got end-stage renal disease. He's on um, uh, dialysis. He's got severe neuropathy. He's a real bad diabetic. I think his A1C when I saw him uh, was in the range of 12 or 13. Uh, he had an infected pilon uh, that had been flapped, and they left his hardware, and he then showed up in my office. Uh, so we washed him out, um, antibiotics, removed his hardware, um, and we had to make a decision. If you look, you know, he's got this anterior bone loss where beads are placed. Um, you know, he's got, uh, you know, reasonable bone stock. Uh, I thought based on his, uh, you know, complication, risk profile, you know, you could do IND again, fusion with an X-fix. Uh, you could try to do an isolated ankle fusion, although he had significant pain in the sub joint. I worried about an isolated ankle non-union, uh, and so I elected to do a TTC fusion on him. Uh, so we took him to the operating room, did a TTC fusion with a Dyna nail. I did a transfibular approach. Uh, I wanted to be able to look right at the joint. I uh, used the fibula for bone graft, which is one of the tricks I, I found. I found with these patients, if they're getting a TTC, I think saving the fibula is probably not needed. Um, I do think it's important for patients with an isolated ankle fusion to think about it because long-term takedown. Um, total ankle replacement, but I, I don't think this guy is a candidate for that long term. Uh, but at one year, you know, he had no issues. Four, four months out, he was full weight bearing, uh, really psyched. Uh, he hadn't walked in about a year before I saw him, um, but was really happy. Uh, these are his first post-operative visits. Uh, you can see that the element is even starting to compress on his first visit. Uh, he's doing well. Um, and then you can see a one-year follow-up. He's got really good healing. Uh, anteriorly and posteriorly, he's healed like gangbusters. Um, He's got healing on two views, uh, and he's really happy. Uh, this next guy is a uh, morbidly obese bishop from Atlanta. Uh, he's a super nice guy, but this had this just amazing amount of deformity. Um, he travels for work. Um, he had tried an Arizona brace. Um, you know, I thought some element of this is you know, neuropathic. I don't know if it's Frank Charcot, but he's certainly neuropathic to be able to walk on an ankle this unstable, um, you know, eroding away his fifth metatarsal, just beating on it constantly. And, you know, and I think from a, you know, a treatment perspective, uh, you know, I think a hindsight fusion is the ideal way to go. Um, you can see the, the, the wrinkles in his skin just from the amount, the pure size of his leg. Uh, and so we talked to him about a TTC fusion. Uh, I thought this would get him back to being as active as possible, but I think he's at high risk for a non-union. His soft tissue envelope is difficult. He's morbidly obese. He's a diabetic, but he's pretty reasonably controlled. Um, so we took him to the operating room. Uh, again, we did a transfibular approach with TTC. Uh, I had him full weight bearing at 10 weeks, and I probably could even get him weight bearing sooner. Uh, this is one of the first few that I did. Uh, I was really pleased. Uh, he had full activities at six months. Um, and, uh, you know, I recently saw him back at one year. Uh, this is his first post-operative visit. You're just starting to see the element compress. Um, you know, we really, uh, you know, put him in a good position. Um, and then, you know, one year he's just healed great. Looks tremendous. Uh, doing everything he wants to do. Uh, I saw him the other day. He's getting his total knee done on his other side because he wants to exercise and get back to playing golf. Uh, couldn't be happier with my surgery. Um, and, I, you know, I, we got him really uh, a great correction for him and uh, really well aligned. Uh, this third case is a recent case I did uh, probably three or four months ago. This poor lady, 
uh, got taken care of by an outside surgeon. Uh, they tried to do a subtalar fusion three different times. Uh, the last time they tried an internal bone stimulator. Uh, she was then referred to me, um, and she was wondering if she should have an amputation. As you can see on her x-rays, she's just got severe collapse uh, through her subtalar joint. Uh, she's got severe ankle uh, issues. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I thought long and hard about her. Uh, I think there's some interesting work um, uh, uh, about, you know, whether you need to do a bulk allograft here, whether you need to reestablish length. Um, I think for some of these older patients, ladies in their late 60s, uh, my thought is if I can just get her ankle and hind foot healed, give her a stable to walk on, I think a little bit of shortening may help her, uh, you know, ground clearance and those kind of things. Uh, so we elected to do a posterior approach, TTC fusion, uh, remove her hardware, uh, and then try to get somewhat of a posterior fusion uh, from the back of her uh, uh, tibia to her calcaneus, as well as approach the ankle and subtalar joints. Uh, she did really well. Uh, she's weight-bearing now. She feels so much better. Her wounds healed quite well. You can see in the back there all the bone grafts we laid down. Uh, I think it's going to really uh, lead to her having a great result. Um, you know, she's lined up well. Uh, we fixed her approximately with one dynamic screw. Uh, I think the rod's in good position, and uh, overall, uh, I think she's going to continue to progress well. Uh, fourth case, which we'll review, uh, you know, I think infection's another area where uh, continued bone healing is a trouble. This is a 58-year-old female referred to me after multiple IEDs uh, and wound healing issues. Uh, she had a draining wound the first time I met her. Um, we talked to her about the options. We IMD'd her, placed antibiotic bead, um, but she had this unbelievably beat up uh, ankle and subtalar joint, collapsed talus, um, eroded away tibia. Um, so we talked about the options, and I thought, you know, you know, tibia TTC fusion. I offered her an X fix. Uh, she's a thin lady. I thought an X fix may be less risky than going back in, uh, but she was adamant that uh, she wanted an internal fixation. Uh, and so we took her to the operating room and did a TTC fusion. Her intraop cultures were negative. Uh, as uh, all good things uh, uh, happen, uh, she fell and broke her other ankle at uh, six weeks out, and we had to fix both. Uh, and now she's full activities on both sides six months out, really happy with her result. Uh, she's full weight bearing now. Um, we had a full weight bearing at three months, but probably could have gone sooner. Um, and I think she's healing really well. Um, you know, bone graft the fibula, put her rod in good position. Uh, and I think she's going to be really pleased. Um, just want to give you guys an example. Um, this is a case from uh, Sam Adams at Duke. Uh, he had a guy with a really bad talus fracture, went on to develop AVN, as you can see here. Uh, he did a uh, femoral head allograft with Trinity Elite. Uh, he used a uh, TTC rod, the Dynanail. Uh, and as you can see, the bulk allograft there based on his fluoroscopic views in the OR. Um, this is just his six week post op. You know, you know, showing all the hardware in good position. Uh, you can see him three months out, weight bearing is tolerated, no pain, progressing well. Uh, I think it's a, you know, great result. And as you can see, it just gets better and better. Six months, still no pain, starting to really incorporate well. You can see the good incorporation of the femoral head. Uh, you can see healing across both of his joints on two views. Uh, you know, I think that anterior aspect of his tailor neck is continuing to heal. But as you can see in this last view, I think this is a tremendous result. You know, and I think bulk allograft uh, can be done really well. Uh, I only do it when I absolutely have to, um, but I think this is just a great example. Uh, again, I think a real important thing is looking at patients after total ankle replacement. Um, this is an example from another surgeon uh, who, you know, really uh, did a nice job, a bulk allograft uh, to maintain length uh, after a failed total ankle replacement to provide the patient with appropriate alignment. You can see good incorporation on the CAT scan on both the sagittal and uh, coronal views. Uh, I think this is just a tremendous success, um, but I think a lot has to do with using the nail and its compressive elements uh, to continue that compression to stimulate that healing uh, across those bony surfaces. Now, this is just another example of a TTC uh, using a dynanail uh, after uh, failed total ankle replacement, a great incorporation uh, over a year out. Um, I think down the line, uh, we're gonna start doing more and more uh, Advanced Technologies is an example of uh, Sam Adams' case uh, from Duke uh, using a TTC fusion uh, with a 3D ball uh, instead of a femoral head allograft. Uh, he packs the ball with uh, allograft uh, to get it to heal but provides the um, 3D printed strut. Uh, I think this is just another example of where the technology is going. So my current technique for these 
uh, is I fix them uh, with one or two screws distally. I think I've had success with one or two. I get two if I can, but I don't stress about it. I then do external compression on my own, um, which is pushing the, everything together. Uh, I have not been doing as much uh, putting across uh, the external compression with the tool. I do worry about creating a stress fracture, stress riser uh, in some of these uh, uh, diabetic charcoal patients. Uh, then fix the dynamic screw proximally. I want that continuous dynamic compression as soon as they weight bear. Uh, if I ever get a full six millimeters of compression, I want the body to be able to compress on its own. Uh, I try to weight bear all these patients at six weeks without neurologic dysfunction, but obviously for those neuropathics, Charcot, uh, we go a little slower and they're probably weight bearing at around 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, one of the thoughts with the uh, initial uh, jig uh, was that you could have anterior screw miss, and I've certainly had my issues. Uh, this is one example where I had an anterior screw. Um, but I think the guys at MedShape have done a really nice job uh, addressing the frame. Uh, they've uh, come up with a carbon fiber external guide. Uh, there's definitely more room for the foot. Uh, and I think, it, uh, I think the foot uh, getting caught on the guide was leading to the guide being pushed uh, and was leading to you missing a little bit anterior and I haven't had trouble. Uh, this is just an example of the targeting frame uh, over the new carbon fiber. Uh, over here you can see uh, this is where you pull down to get your compressive element. You dial in your amount of uh, stretch you want. This is to do compression on the outside. Significantly rigid uh, carbon fiber uh, peak targeting frame uh, with good thicker tubes. Uh, this slide specifically talks about the adjustments. Uh, the tube geometry uh, has been thickened and more rigid. Uh, the PA attachment has more space uh, and there's a lot more space for the foot, which I think is going to be real critical uh, to preventing any issues uh, with the nail itself. So in summary, um, I think the Dyna nail is a really important tool in my armamentarium and memory. Um, I think there's good sound basic science support for it, uh, as well as good clinical evidence. Uh, I think there's definitely uh, continuous compression. Uh, I think it's definitely a load sharing device. Uh, overall, I think it mimics uh, an external fixator uh, and provides some of the, issues, the benefits of an external fixator without the associated issues. Um, and we're really seeing good clinical results. Uh, it's a valuable tool for my high risk patients. Uh, and I'm going to really try to continue to use it. Uh, so I'm going to take a look at some of the questions uh, that have been asked uh, and see. So um, thanks for listening. Uh, please uh, uh, send me the questions if you have any. Thank you.